and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, from Hawaii, depending on what time zone you're joining us from. I'm Bob Garrier, president of the Pacific Forum, and a welcome to the inaugural edition of the U.S.-Philippines Indo-Pacific Conversation Series. Our virtual webinar discussions organized with support from the U.S. Embassy in Manila and in partnership with the Foreign Service Institute Philippines. A long-standing ally of the United States, the U.S.-Philippine relationship has deep roots. This bilateral relationship is a key part in the maintenance of peace, stability, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. Today, we'll focus on Coast Guard cooperation and maritime security in Southeast Asia. What makes the U.S.-Philippine bilateral relationship so important? What can our two countries do and are doing now, both together and with other Southeast Asian countries? Maritime security is a vast issue. It encompasses traditional and non-traditional security aspects from the state level to non-state actors. It encompasses maritime domain awareness, governance, law enforcement, resources, trade, environmental stewardship, as well as law enforcement and sovereignty related issues. Our conversation today will touch on these points, focusing on where cooperation can and should lead in this most dynamic and often contested region. To help us understand the dynamics of this important relationship and the region, we're joined today by Vice Admiral Linda Fagan, U.S. Coast Guard, and Dr. Jay Tariella, Commissioned Officer also in the Philippine Coast Guard. Let me just give you a little intro about our speakers' backgrounds because they have tremendous talent. Uh, Vice Admiral Linda Fagan assumed command of the Coast Guard Pacific Area in June 2018, excuse me, where she serves as the operational commander for all U.S. Coast Guard missions, literally from the Rocky Mountains to the waters off the east coast of Africa. She concurrently serves as Commander Defense Force West and provides Coast Guard mission support to the Department of Defense and combatant commanders. Admiral Fagan has served in all seven continents, from the snows of Ross Island, Antarctica, to the heart of Africa, from Tokyo to Geneva, and many ports uh, along the way. She's had many flag officer assignments, as you could imagine, in Washington, Deputy Commandant for Operations, Policy, and Capabilities, a Commander, 1st Coast Guard District, that's up in New England, back in the U.S. mainland. Deputy Director of Operations for Headquarters, a U.S. Northern Command, advising the, the Commander of U.S. Northcom on mission operations. Commander of Sector New York, uh, with responsibility for all Coast Guard missions in the greater New York metropolitan area. That goes all the way up to Albany, uh, upstate. Her operational assignments include sea duty on board the, Car uh, the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Polar Star and more than 15 years as a Marine Inspector. She has an extensive interagency as well as intergovernmental experience, work with both the IMO and the International Labor Organization on flag state and port state issues. She's a U.S. Coast Guard Academy graduate, holds master's degrees in marine affairs from the University of Washington, and a master's degree in national resource strategy from the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. And again, we're delighted to have Admiral Fagan with us today. Incredible background. Dr. Jay Tariella is a commissioned officer of the Philippine Coast Guard with the rank of commander. Uh, he's currently a PhD candidate and a Japan International Cooperation Agency ASEAN Public Policy Leadership Scholar at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, GRIPS, and under the GRIPS Global Governance Program in Tokyo, Japan. Previously, he was assigned uh, at the Philippine Coast Guard National Headquarters in Manila, working maritime security capability development and organizational restructuring reforms. He's also acted as the personal advisor to the Philippine Coast Guard Commandant on human resource management, particularly on recruitment plans, career management, and personnel specialization. He's attended numerous military and Coast Guard training uh, uh, venues locally and abroad. He holds a graduate degree from the Philippine Merchant Marine Academy Graduate School and a Master of Policy Studies from GRIPS and the Japan Coast Guard Academy, where he was part of the inaugural class of the Maritime Safety and Security Program that was launched jointly by both institutions in 2016. I also wanna make a quick plug. He's also a young leader with Pacific Forum Honolulu, and he's written uh, opinion editorial articles published in The Diplomat, The National Interest, Analyzing War, and other leading publications. So before we uh, move into and listen to uh, hear from our speakers, just a couple of important announcements. This session will be recorded. Uh, all remarks, including those during the Q&A period are on the record. Also, the views expressed by the speakers and myself as a moderator do not necessarily reflect the views and official positions of the U.S. Department of State and the U.S. Embassy in Manila, nor do they reflect the positions of the Pacific Forum or our home institutions of the speakers. Finally, we're also live, not just through the Zoom platform, 
we're on right here, but also on Facebook. So just, just be mindful of these points, please. Now, uh, let me turn over to, uh, to our guest speakers. We're gonna start off with Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jay Tariella first, followed by uh, Admiral Fagan. So Dr. Uh, Dr. Tariella, over to you. Thank you, Bob. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm honored to uh, join Vice Admiral Linda Fagan to join this webinar. Um, to reiterate the disclaimer, I am uh, participating in my uh, private capacity. Uh, my statements do not represent the institution that I belong to, uh, particularly the Philippine Coast Guard and the Philippine government. My presentation focuses on the critical role and uh, importance of the United States Coast Guard in engaging Coast Guards in the region in strengthening its maritime cooperation. My presentation has four points. Uh, first, um, I will highlight that external powers uh, utilization of Coast Guard in the region is not something new. Secondly, I will uh, touch upon the Coast Guard's uh, multifaceted functions to explain why it can establish the regional cooperation among the littoral states. Third, I will argue that um, Coast Guard cooperation can either be complementary or substitute for the Navy in maintaining maritime cooperation in the region. Lastly, I will uh, lay down some policy recommendation as I conclude my presentation. The Japanese government has long uh, practiced the utilization of Coast Guard organization in establishing maritime cooperation in Southeast Asia. The United States uh, can take a look on how Japan utilized its white ships in engaging the countries in the region. As an island nation with the scarce resources and uh, reliant on sea trade droughts to survive, Japan has um, redefined its maritime diplomacy by utilizing white ships as an effective foreign policy instrument. Unlike um, other, other powerful countries that can use naval forces like the United States to protect its sea lines of communication, Japan has to be innovative in dealing with Southeast Asia's sovereign sensitivities due to its uh, peace constitution and its imperialist past. From lighthouse construction in Malacca Strait way back in 1969 to being an oil spill cleaner in 1975 due to the massive oil spill caused by the Japanese tanker Showa Maru. Then in addressing piracy in the late 1990s, Japan has consistently relied on its Coast Guard organization for more than five decades now in ensuring the safety and security of its maritime trade. Universally, Coast Guard organizations have multifaceted functions in maritime safety, marine environmental protection, and maritime law enforcement. Though White House nowadays are primarily seen as a tool of the state in patrolling disputed waters, it is necessary to underscore that um, Coast Guard organization tackles many national security and maritime priorities of littoral states in Southeast Asia. This could be uh, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, piracy, armed robbery at sea, drug trafficking, um, maritime terrorism, oil spill response, smuggling, ship collision, search and rescue, and even responding to maritime disasters. These functions enable these countries to have more avenues for regional cooperation in addressing mutual interests. It is uh, worth noting that um, these Coast Guard roles do not just assist the national interest of one particular littoral state, but it also support the regional maritime order. Finally, what can be the role of the United States Coast Guard in the region? It depends um, on the circumstances. If the domestic political condition is favorable to military to military engagement, then the Coast Guard engagement can serve as a complement. This Coast Guard operations can support and amplify naval, naval efforts and cooperation. And if there is a domestic contentious uh, political dynamics, which would prevent uh, military to military engagement, then the Coast Guard engagement can serve as a temporary substitute and still achieve maritime security cooperation between the United States and Southeast Asian countries. In other words, Coast Guard can serve as complements in instances whereby there is a strong security cooperation with Washington, such as, for example, Singapore and the United States. 
But in those occasions that there are national leaders in the region that are not comfortable in employing means of military cooperation, perhaps some of those uh, chief executives that are reluctant to pick a side in a great power competition due to their uh, economic relationship with China, for example, then the Coast Guard can temporarily substitute Navy to Navy engagement and still achieve the same results, which is maintaining regional maritime cooperation and stability. In the previous administration in Manila, for example, when its former chief executive is bent on strengthening the alliance with the United States, the Navy to Navy engagement then, together with the Coast Guard, has persistently and constantly moved forward. They complement each other because they have two different functions. And in terms of capacity building, the naval engagement and Coast Guard engagement provide different things as the United States uh, supported these agencies as well separately. For example, the US government has supported the establishment of the National Coast Watch Center while actively um, supporting the Philippine Navy during the time of the previous president. However, when the political tides turned and the government administration in Manila was no longer favorable to Navy to Navy engagements, you can still maintain a certain degree of cooperation and still achieve maritime security in the Philippine waters through the Coast Guard engagement. In 2016, when Manila declared that the war games between the United States and the Philippines should soon be halted, it became evident that the Philippine Coast Guard had an unusual increase in maritime exercises together with foreign Coast Guards. Since the change of the national leadership, the US funded Southeast Asian cooperation and training has been hosted annually by the Philippine Coast Guard and was held for the fourth time in 2019. Also in that year, the two U.S. Coast Guard cutters participated in two different maritime exercises in the Philippines. It was not condemned, neither criticized by the current president, which included participation by the U.S. Coast Guard cutter Bertolt and held near the vicinity of Scarborough Shoal. And of course, the U.S. Coast Guard cutter Stratton also took part in the maritime training activity Sama Sama with the maritime forces of Japan, the United States, and even the Philippines. This was also held near the contested waters of Palawan Islands. It is also worth noting that since 2016, the United States government has tremendously increased the number of Philippine Coast Guard personnel who went to the United States for various training in different US Coast Guard facilities. This year, there will be um, four Filipino uh, graduating cadets at the United States Coast Guard Academy and that is the highest number of graduates in the Philippine history. Despite the apparent bid of the current administration to move away from Washington, he has still allowed the US Coast Guard to engage the Philippine Coast Guard. Understanding that the capacity building is not intended to purely apply in choosing a side on a great power competition. In conclusion, I have the following recommendations. First, the United States should take the lead role in coordinating Coast Guard capacity building efforts by like-minded states in Southeast Asia. It can tap countries like Japan, Australia, European Union, and India to have coordinated approaches to avoid duplication and redundancy and uh, make sure that each capacity building effort are beneficial and strategic to the countries in the region. Secondly, the United States should uh, facilitate the division of labor in the Coast Guard organization's capacity building in the region. For example, the Japanese government can carry out the ship's construction with whatever modalities, whether through grants or loans. The US government or even its allies can perhaps support installing armaments, small armaments and weapons on board those vessels which are only appropriate in carrying out maritime law enforcement. Next is for the standardization of Coast Guard protocols in the region. The United States can take the lead in institutionalizing Coast Guard protocols in the region that could define the conduct and limit the operations of the White House. It should be a legally accepted code following the existing and relevant international laws that could arrest 
Coast Guard's um, increasingly alarming gray zone operations in the region. It is also worth noting that unlike the Navy, which has a code of unplanned encounters at sea or queues, the White House do not have such agreement. Due to the increasing number of White House patrolling the contested waters in South China Sea, it is about time that such a similar protocol be set to prevent these white ships from being a highly possible trigger of regional destabilization. Lastly, the United States and the Philippines has to sit down as treaty allies to discuss openly and strategically how to respond with gray zone activities, especially those that concern the reversal of the status quo of the contested territories in the South China Sea. It is important to mention that the Philippine Coast Guard vessels are public vessels, and therefore, many scholars have been saying that these are covered by the Articles 4 and 5 of the Mutual Defense Treaty. Therefore, it is crucial that the Philippines and the United States have to be on the same page on how to deal with the gray zone tactics of other Coast Guard organizations in the region. And since the Scarborough Shoal standoff in 2012 has taught all claimant states in the region not to employ gray ships in carrying out maritime law enforcement in the contested waters, the next standoff will likely be between the Philippine Coast Guard vessels and other Coast Guard organizations in the region that are being employed as part of their gray zone strategy. Therefore, the United States and the Philippines must meet and plan out how the latter could respond to the gray zone activities. If not, should another controversial standoff happen again, then it will be easier for both sides to operational, operationalize what they have planned to do in dealing with gray zone strategy. Um, thank you very much. That ends my presentation. Thanks very much, Jay, most appreciated. Uh, Admiral Fagan, the, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, thanks, Jay, and thanks, uh, thanks, Bob. Good, good morning, afternoon, uh, evening. I know we're uh, we're spread across a number of a uh, number of time zones. Really a pleasure to be here with all of you. I'm in uh, I'm in the San Francisco uh, Bay Area. Uh, so Admiral Gary and the Pacific uh, Forum, thank you. The Foreign Service Institute of the Philippines, the U.S. State Department, the Embassy in Manila. Uh, thanks for providing this forum for uh, for this conversation and, and discussion. And the Philippines and U.S. Coast Guard share just a really incredibly uh, strong and deep relationship, and I, I look forward to this uh, this engagement today. So I want to talk to you about uh, about a couple of things. Uh, one, the U.S. Coast Guard's global operations in the Pacific, the importance of Coast Guards to maritime security, and then illustrate uh, U.S. Coast Guard value and Coast Guard value in the context of uh, of IUU fishing. First, a little bit about uh, about the Coast Guard, the U.S. Coast Guard, and you know, Admiral Gary mentioned my uh, my area of responsibility. Uh, you know, it encompasses uh, the the vast expanse of the the Pacific. It uh, uh, includes six of seven continents, seventy one countries, seventy four million square miles of ocean, uh, and as he indicated, from the Rocky Mountains to uh, to to the coast of Africa, and includes both poles. So I also spend quite a bit of time talking about some of our uh, Arctic and Antarctic uh, security uh, challenges. Um, you know what. What you can say or observe about the region, and you know, I've certainly seen this firsthand in the nearly three years I've been in this job, is that we're experiencing a period of unprecedented uh, change and threat, uh, man-made and environmental, and it uh, just increases uh, the risk and the and the dynamics of, uh, of the the problem set and the conversation that we're going to have uh, this evening. So in order to counter some of these threats, I have about 13,000 active duty reserve and civilian employee employees who are spread across the region uh, conducting Coast Guard operations. Uh, you know, everything from small boat units to air stations, major cutters and major shore based uh, units, as well as uh, deployable specialized uh, forces and then staff elements to create policy and, and resourcing for our frontline folks. And similar to the Philippine Coast Guard, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard is not in the Department of Defense, and this is often a point of confusion uh, in the U.S. with uh, some of my DOD pairs. So the U.S. Coast Guard is simultaneously and at all times a military service and a law enforcement service. 
So I carry the same ID card that my, my DOD counterparts carry, but, but we reside within the Department of Homeland Security as opposed to the Department of Defense. So as I said, we are at all times a regulatory agency, a military agency, a law enforcement service, an operational service. I, I kind of like to characterize it sometimes like a maritime constabulary. And the, the great power in the US Coast Guard is we are all of those things at all times. We don't have to send a ship in or send a different ship out or switch hats. We, we can operate uh, nimbly and flexibly between uh, all of those uh, authorities and do so concurrently uh, day in and day out. So our responsibilities include a maritime law enforcement, managing navigation, conducting search and rescue, regulating vessel safety, uh, fisheries enforcement, and living marine uh, resource uh, enforcement boardings, port security and pollution response. And if this isn't enough, we're also a full member of the US intelligence community and are able to operate uh, independently with authorities uh, under, the, under the intelligence uh, law and code. So, um, you know, talk about law enforcement. We, uh, we work to, uh, to, to govern and oversee some of our port maritime transportation uh, system from a safety and a security standpoint. We've got a, a role in uh, cybersecurity, particularly as it pertains to uh, the maritime transportation system. And, uh, you know, again, just provide uh, all, all of this to, uh, to the public uh, that, that we, we serve. So let's talk a little bit about the, the, the geopolitics and we've started to touch on already. And I, you know, I wanna start by saying, uh, you know, the United States is a Pacific nation. And so we're gonna talk, um, you know, about, uh, you know, South China Sea, Oceania and the Western Pacific. The US is absolutely a Pacific nation. And the Coast Guard's role in Oceania and Indo-Pacific goes back over 150 years. So some of our recent ship deployments in the last couple of years, well, they may be, uh, recent and um, in they, it is not new. We've operated uh, in the region for, for a long time. And our goal to counter threats, any threats to economic stability, anything that threaten, threatens free trade and sovereignty of the nations in Oceania and Indo Pacific, that's, you know, that's sort of the intent and uh, you know, goal for uh, being, being present in, uh, in the region. And you know the vastness of the Pacific Ocean challenges all of us, right? Resource constraints definitely present a challenge with whether it's maritime domain awareness, uh, enforcement capabilities and capacity, and and it leaves the region vulnerable to narcotics trafficking, human smuggling, IUU fishing, piracy, terrorist activities. You know, economic security is national security, and unimpeded trade and respect for maritime boundaries. Uh, requires a maritime governance regime that respects the rights and access of all nations. And the regime must maintain the long-standing principles of maritime cooperation, rule of law, good governance, and a respect for international laws and, and norms. <clears throat> and the maritime regions are all interconnected and in the behavior of a nation in a particular geographic region uh, impacts other, uh, other nations in other areas. And, um, you know, in particular, just, uh, you know, the, the conduct and adherence to maritime values, uh, you know, across the globe is an, is an important stabilizing uh, force in the, in the maritime uh, domain. You know, Coast Guard's deeply committed to, to leveraging our capabilities and our authorities to be a true partner. And I know when we get into the, the Q&A, we'll talk about uh, the partnership between the U.S. Coast Guard and Philippine Coast Guard, which is, is strong and strengthening and, um, you know, together we share a commitment to rules-based behavior and, and values. Um, together, Coast Guards uphold values. They represent a cohesive global maritime security regime. So, you know, presence matters. Remote monitoring is an important part of MDA, but, uh, you know, virtual, uh, virtual presence is actual absence in some of the threat stream that we're, we're talking about here. And so helping uh, bring uh, bring those capabilities to, to gather and um, you know strengthen the network of Coast Guards is an important part of the conversation that we need to be having in in the region. You know, Coast Guards are a line of defense against illicit actors on the water. Our forces preserve international order and necessary for each of our nation's security and economic prosperity. Partnerships, domestic and international, are the path to success. Both bilateral and multilateral agreements joint operations, collaborative commitment to shared values are our most effective tool. I would argue, give us a competitive advantage 
uh, against uh, combating coercive and, and domineering behavior at sea. We say that uh, you know the U.S. Coast Guard, we uh, we're the bridge. We, we sit in that space between DoD lethality and the State Department's diplomacy. And I think we sit in that that niche in a really powerful and impactful way that's useful to nations in the regions wherever they are on their uh, you know journey towards uh, you know either building a Coast Guard or or operating a Coast Guard. So the, uh, the white holes and the red racing stripes on the U.S. Coast Guard cutters, uh, they, they can go and collaborate and gain access to, to areas that the gray hold combatants just, just cannot. Our expertise in environmental protection, law enforcement, search and rescue, aids to navigation, all are areas where we can, we can partner and engage with, uh, with other nations. Professional exchanges, training, operations, all are ways to strengthen this collaboration and build and nurture the partnerships and network that we will all need. Coast Guards and nations operate best when we're transparent and we respect each other's sovereignty and we respect the agreed international order. It's vital that as leaders and operators, we conduct our missions in a manner that is professional in all our interactions with the public, with commercial mariners and the other military services and government uh, agencies that are operating throughout uh, the region. I wanna to just touch briefly on the, on IUUF, uh, we recently, the Commandant of the Coast Guard, along with uh, Admiral Fowler, the Southcom commander, recently announced the U.S. Coast Guard's IUU Fishing Strategic uh, Outlook. It's a 10-year plan and includes three lines of effort. This is available if you just uh, you, you can find it uh, on on the internet. It's all open source document. The three lines of effort: one is to promote uh, targeted, effective, intelligence-driven enforcement operations. You know, this is a, the the push to get at uh, illumination of the network so you understand where the activity is going on. So when you take the precious resource of a ship with people on it, you put it on vector. You're not just hunting around out there for, uh, for the illicit activity. Second is counter predatory and irresponsible state behavior. Uh, third is expand multilateral fisheries, enforcement cooperation, think regional fisheries management organizations. Again, this concept of network and uh, multilateral uh, and bilateral tools to, uh, to, to, to strengthen uh, our, our counter to some of the illicit activity. Um, you know, so you, you said I've talked a, a several times, right, partnership, multilateral, multi. So a, a good example of the kinds of things I'm talking about are forums like a Seemly, right? It brings together nations to discuss matters like IUF and allow a robust conversation on the types of enforcement goals and initiatives uh, regionally that might might be of use or value. Uh, there is not one nation uh, represented here on this forum tonight that has all the resources necessary to, uh, to, to protect sovereignty, sustain fish stocks. And the goal with the strategic outlook is to begin uh, you know, a, a more global conversation with regard to countering the IUU threat. It truly, there is not one region of the world that does not uh, experience some type of IUU threat um, from from a number of different uh, countries and sources. So, you know, finally, modern maritime security threats fall across the spectrum of you know economic and defense issues, and we should uh, view them broadly, not narrowly, as we as we talk about this. And Coast Guards are uniquely suited to interoperate with other federal agencies, international agencies, non governmental organizations as we address all these threats and. Um, you know, the, the U.S. Coast Guard, we take great pride in our um, sort of multilingual, multifaceted approach to some of these promises where, um, you know, we, when, when we talk about C2, you know, we do mean command and control as a military organization, but we also mean communicate, cooperate, collaborate, right? That, those definitions of the C words are what gets us, uh, gets us uh, some, some strength and, and way ahead cooperatively and together. And so finally, the red racing stripe painted on the bows of our ships, they're a symbol of professionalism, good governance, hope. I'm proud to be part of the tradition of the U.S. Coast Guard, and I'm proud that we're able to, uh, um, you know, have ships that, uh, that operate in the region and, uh, you know, look, look forward to everyone's questions. And uh, thanks very much, Bob. Well, thanks, Admiral Fagan, and thanks to both speakers for some terrific opening comments and, and lots of things to, for us to all think about. Um, I'm going to go ahead and prime the pump here, uh, but uh, with, a, with, a, with a question or two up front. But just let me just review as we go into the question and answer phase here for the audience. And we've got almost 300 people joining us. Uh, 
uh, which is absolutely wonderful. But there's two main methods that we use. It's uh, both the um, uh, uh, both Q and A, uh, and then here they are on the screen. You should be able to see. Uh, you can use chat to type in a question, uh, or also use the uh, raise hand feature. Uh, and um, I'm already looking at a, a bunch in the uh, in the Q and A queue. Uh, but let me let me just start off. And uh, again, you all can read those uh, and acquaint yourselves with the appropriate buttons on your screens. Let me just ask to both speakers. I'll start with Jay and then and then Admiral Fagan. Um, just an opening comment about um, you know the recently enacted China Coast Guard law permitting use of force against foreign vessels. This gets a lot of play. Uh, a lot of articles have been written about it among scholars uh, in the news and so forth. Just any comments uh, or, uh, or reactions to that from each of your perspectives. Jay, with you first, then then Admiral Fagan. Thank you, Bob, for your question. Um, thank you, Admiral Fagan, for your uh, interesting um, uh, presentation a while ago. Um, for me to answer that que um, question about the uh, new uh, Chinese Coast Guard law, I would like to um, first mention that the use of force for maritime law enforcement in the region is also being used by other Coast Guards. For example, the Philippine Coast Guard, um, Japan Coast Guard is also doing using um, this particular use of force in maritime law enforcement and other Southeast Asian countries. But I think the most um, problem problematic um, part why the Chinese Coast Guard law is um, seemingly being criticized by Southeast Asian countries as well. It's because of its um, maritime jurisdiction implementation. It is not clear whether um, they are going to implement that use of force um, within the nine dash line that they claim um, with um, the articles of the, the that particular Chinese Coast Guard law. It is very, um, um, it's uh, very broad, mentioning that um, it uh, will be implemented in those uh, Chinese claimed uh, maritime jurisdiction. So the question is, are they referring to the nine dash line? So that is, um, I think, the main contention of that law. And um, for us to uh, look at the Chinese maritime jurisdiction and the nine dash line, we also have to consider the fact that the nine dash line claim of the Chinese was already um, been decided by the International Tribunal in 2016 that is illegal. So if they are going to implement that new Coast Guard law to uh, the nine dash line area that they claim, I would say that it would be illegal. Thanks, Jay. Um, Admiral? Yeah, thanks. You know, most Many Coast Guards, the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, have authority to use uh, use of force in in some capacity. Um, I think the you know concern with regard to the the China Coast Guard uh, law uh, is over. You know there there is some ambiguity, as Jay points out. You know when it, it authorizes a use of force against foreign vessels uh, who uh, in the when there's been an infringement of uh, claim sovereignty or sovereignty rights or jurisdiction. So this, the, this does get right to, um, you know, does that use of force authorization extend to those areas where there are ongoing territorial and maritime disputes? And, uh, you know, that, that is, uh, I think, you know, really kind of the, the crux of the, uh, you know, concern or challenge, um, you know, from a, from a, just international law standpoint, right? International law, the law of the Sea Convention, maritime forces must at all times act with professionalism and restraint in the exercise of their authorities. And that's including refraining from threat or use of force. I think, you know, that that for me is really the kind of the, 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 the governing um, oversight here. And we find it in the, you know, in the law of the sea from an accepted, uh, you know, international uh, norms of, of behavior. Thanks. Thanks for both the responses and, and uh, just a, a, a comment from me on the follow-up and, and Admiral. I mean, the point you made up front, uh, you know, is that again, it's not actually that remarkable that the uh, Coast Guard has the authorization for use of force. It all depends on how they use it, I think. So perhaps there's a lot of splash about this issue and then we'll see where it goes. Is that is that kind of the sense over? 
Yeah, I, you know, I think right time was that we've, we've had 230 years of experience. And so there's, you know, there's a pattern of behavior, this, um, you know, time, I think time will reveal for us um, how, uh, how that, that is, is used. And uh, again, I, you know, I'm, I'm heartened by the, the, the standards and the, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the governance that we find, uh, you know, in the, in the uh, unclose and the law, the law of the sea convention, I think that that helps ground us as a, you know, all as Coast Guards and, and maritime entities as we as we move forward. Super, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna run to some of the questions in the Q&A here. Um, gosh, Admiral Mackey, you've got three questions you're asking that I get to choose because I'm the moderator. So I'm gonna pick on your third one here. We've got 300 people I'm gonna sort through, but sir, you got, I'm gonna lead off with your question. Um, and, and and Richard Mackey for our, uh, our, uh, our attendees here, a former, uh, Pacific commander uh, uh, um, back in the day. And so lots of perspective. But my the question is really currently China seems to have an awful large number of ships around Scarborough Shoals. Uh, but let me let me even put a sharper point on that. I mean, I think in the news reports, not so much Scarborough as there's some 200 Chinese vessels uh, reported in the news just a couple of days ago or, uh, around Whitson Reef. And that's uh, what, about 175, uh, 175 miles west of Palawan. Um, well within the Philippine EEZ. So there's been some, you know, obviously reporting about that, uh, as well as U.S. Uh, uh, backing the Philippines. Uh, but let me, let me uh, just uh, pitch that to Jay first, and then uh, an Admiral, if you'd like to have any comments afterwards. Any comments about, about again, the, is it a surprise? Is it a trend you've been seeing? Uh, just any commentary at all about this particular situation. Thanks. Um, thank you, Admiral, for um, that interesting question, and it's very timely. Um, it is true that the Whitson Reef is um, currently occupied by a uh, Chinese uh, fishing flotilla. So um, for me to answer that question, I would like to go back to my uh, last policy recommendations that I made uh, during my presentation. Um, this is one of um, the main reasons why I am actually um, recommending for the United States and the Philippine government as treaty allies to uh, discuss on those responses on gray zone activities. Um, learning from the Scarborough Shoal standoff that happened in 2012, uh, supposing that this will be another Scarborough Shoal 2.0, um, I think it is about time that the United States Coast Guard and the US government together with the Philippines as a treaty ally to really um, be on the same page in understanding how and what is the best um, policy option for the Philippine government to carry out um, responding a gray zone strategy like this that is happening now in Whitson Reef. Thanks, Jay. Uh, Admiral, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, thanks. So, um, you know, we, we share the Philippines uh, concern uh, with regard to the, to the massing of the uh, PRC uh, maritime militia vessels near, uh, near the reef. And, um, you know, call on China to exercise professionalism and, you know, responsible, uh, you know, maritime um, be behaviors. Um, you know, nations absolutely have a right to, uh, you know, sort of protect their own, uh, their own, their own sovereignty. Uh, and, you know, building forums that allow for the conversation and, um, you know, opportunity uh, to address, uh, you know, sort of gray, gray zone behaviors in contravention of, uh, you know, international law, I think are, are key and, and speak to the, the partnerships, both bilateral and multilateral uh, that I talked to in my, uh, my opening remarks. Thanks. Thanks very much. I'm going to move on to, uh, to a question from Jeremy Rodriguez. And this is a, it's a great question. Actually, I don't think any of you touched it yet, maybe broadly, but what is the role of volunteer, as in civilian support, Coast Guard organizations in the region, such as the U.S. and Philippines Coast Guard Auxiliary? And how can these organizations assist their active duty counterparts and contribute to stability in the region? And I'll go back to Jay and, 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 uh, and Admiral again in that order, if you wouldn't mind. But uh, it's a super question about capacity, I think it says. Um, for the Philippines, we, uh, I would uh, uh, like to recognize our um, members of the Philippine Coast Guard Auxiliary. They are actually um, the same pattern that we did, um, that the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary is doing. They are basically our uh, civilian volunteers that support the Philippine Coast Guard operations, whether um, related to search and rescue or maritime safety. 
So um, it their um, their uh, role is pretty much limited on uh, those functions that are related to uh, maritime environmental protection, maritime safety, and disaster response. So they are not actually um, uh, tapped by the Coast Guard or the Philippine Coast Guard in um, matters related to maritime security and maritime law enforcement. So that's actually the limitation. Yeah, so thanks. Uh, obviously, that you know, the Philippines Coast Guard has modeled their auxiliary off of uh, U.S. Coast Guard. So, we, you know, we have a very similar, in fact, on identical uh, model that we use uh, for our uh, for our auxiliary. And a shout out to our auxiliary force, right? This is an all volunteer force that we get just an incredible amount of um, effort and contribution from, but, you know, primarily focused um you know, in and around the ports and waterways um, in the in the U.S. Uh, so it's everything from you know aids to navigation verification. Yeah, pretty much we're only limited by imagination, but we do uh, prohibit uh, the auxiliary from acting in any. You know, they they don't do law enforcement missions with us. Uh, we generally don't um, send them to sea on our large cutters. Occasionally, we'll get one when we're short a cook or two. We've got some auxiliary chefs that uh, that we'll we'll bring to help. Um, you know, just kind of round out the readiness of uh, of that crew, but really that that contribution and mission is is focused into uh, into our our CONUS uh, mission space. But having said that, there's a lot we wouldn't get done if it weren't for them. They're just a really incredible force multiplier. Thank you both. Uh, another question. Uh, this is uh, from Asura Sala. Uh, she's a uh, actually a fellow with Pacific Forum, originally uh, hails from Brunei, so uh, you know right in the heart of the South China Sea. Uh, and specializes in a lot of maritime issues in her studies and work. Um, her question is, what challenges do you anticipate regional Coast Guards may face in building queues uh, for maritime law enforcement behavior at sea? Uh, is there room for extra regional powers in such an arrangement? Uh, Jay, over to you first, and then uh, again, uh, Admiral. Uh, thank you, Ashura, for um, an interesting question. Uh, well, that's actually, um, one of my policy recommendation, um, calling on the uh, United States Coast Guard to lead the uh, setting up standardization of Coast Guard protocols among um, uh, the developing Coast Guard uh, organizations in the region. Um, I think um, if the Southeast Asian countries will be asked for um, the formulation of cues or the standardization of Coast Guard protocols at sea, um, as far as the Southeast Asian countries are concerned, I think we are in support of establishing that protocol for us to be able to arrest, um, the, as I mentioned, the ever-increasing and alarming gray zone operations in South China Sea. So I think for Southeast Asian countries that have Coast Guard organizations, that won't be a problem. Um, the Philippine Coast Guard and other countries will be supporting the establishment of the Coast Guard Protocol at sea. Admiral, anything to add? Yeah, so, um, you know, we, um, you know, we, the U.S. Coast Guard and, uh, and China Coast Guard, um, not in the recent couple of years, but, but spent quite a bit of time as two Coast Guards uh, working towards negotiating uh, cues and, and rules of behavior, and, and we're not able to uh, come to agreement on that, that MOU. Um, so, you know, it, this is an area that there is perhaps a room for conversations between the Coast Guards, because the, the world's navies all, all, you know, they have the cues, but there are some differing interpretations with regard to just sort of Coast Guard vessel status. Having said that, the U.S. Coast Guard operates under the cues and rules of behavior at all times, whether you know whether there's an MOU in place or not, uh, we uh, we operate and behave in a manner that uh, that is consistent, uh, you know, with 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 cues and and rules of behavior, and certainly encourage, uh, you know, all to do that, um, you know, while while there might be opportunity for a, you know broader uh, you know broader um, MOUs and uh, and negotiations. Now, thanks, Admiral. And, and, and I think a really good and important point to bring up is that when, when Q's was, was crafted, I know it's certainly when, when the U.S. Navy uh, uh, endorsed its use, um, what we were looking for was, it was in particular uh, the fact that it was tracking with normal 
uh, modes of communication that already existed in the international community. And essentially, it's, it's a restatement of that. And essentially, is there's nothing the material or refers you back to existing uh, tools for communication, and essentially endorse them. And I think that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good model for, I guess, emphasizing uh, existing norms that already exist in the maritime uh, domain. And I think that's always a very positive approach to uh, reinforce global norms and not create uh, perhaps regional uh, anomalies. Uh, we can come back to that because that's, uh, that's a, a big, big area of discussion on code of conduct and, and the like. Let me go on and uh, look at some more of these questions. Here's a great one on the pandemic. This is um, from uh, uh, Jan Adam uh, Faktuet, uh, the J and then both Admiral. How did the pandemic uh, affect uh, Coast Guard operations uh, respectively? And uh, Jay, over to you. We'll just keep on batting back and forth if that's okay. Um, interestingly, the Philippine uh, Coast Guard has played a very important role in um, combating pandemic in the Philippines. Um, the Philippine Coast Guard um, um, medical officers and um, medical technologists are the ones uh, who are doing the um, RT-PCR testing while um, the returning Filipinos and overseas Filipino workers enter um, Philippine airports and also at seaports. So. As far as the Coast Guard is concerned, we have been still very active in supporting the interests of the Philippine government, um, whether um, not just in the maritime setting, but in also in various capacities. So thank you. I, I'd love to say, oh, we didn't have any impact. <laughs> it's been a tough year, right? For all of us. I don't care where you are in the world, it is uh, you know, our world. Uh, altered in ways that I think it's going to take another several years to to fully appreciate as um, you know just humans in the you know in the societies that we live in. You know, from a Coast Guard perspective, we continued to uh, generate uh, operational readiness and mission assurance. It was my my top uh, priority as a as a commander was um, getting uh, getting the ships, the large ships that were going, you know, into the East pack into the West pack up into the bearing, uh, underway and underway, uh, in a manner that we had some certainty that we did not, uh, we were not at risk for a major, uh, COVID, uh, outbreak amongst the, the crew. Uh, and that definitely was a, a learning and, a, and an evolution process. We did, um, end up with uh, with two ships where there was, had a little little bit of an outbreak. Had to bring them back in and quarantine the crew. Um, you know, for a month that basically lost about thirty or forty days of frontline operating time as a result of that. Um, so the great news is, right? Vaccines are here. That uh, our frontline people were uh, were our uh, top priority. We just sailed um, Stratton. It's one of the ships we talked about uh, in the Western Pacific. Uh, Stratton's up um, up in the Bering, operating in Alaska. They sail, you know, that that crew is about 115, 120 people, and there was like they're 98 percent vaccinated. That that to me is a good news story and gives us the kind of assurance uh, that we need as frontline uh, operating agencies to uh, uh, generate uh, generate that readiness. Um, you know, the other thing that we've learned, and uh, so this ven this venue is a perfect example of it, right? I, there is. Uh, there are differing workflows and processes where we can leverage technology uh, for ways that can actually be much more impactful and have a broader reach than uh, than what we might have done traditionally uh, be beforehand. And so, you know, thinking and defining for ourselves, hey, what what are some of the things that we by necessity had to incorporate into workflow and process a year ago that we now want to intentionally retain because it uh, creates uh, opportunity and space. I. You know, I had been traveling extensively internationally before this. That obviously all stopped, but um, but I've been able to continue uh, to engage with my uh, international uh, partners and fellow Coast Guards, and whether it's you know J Japan or India or Korea or you know that's just a handful of about uh, you know twelve or fourteen international engagements uh, that I was was able to do. So I see. Well, it's been it's been a challenging year. I see a lot of opportunity and, uh, and and learning for all of us as we as we move uh, forward uh, collectively out of out of COVID slower than I wish, but uh, we seem to all be uh, moving in the right direction. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, my next question uh, from the group is from uh, Anga Reza Prabowo. 
And then this is actually gets at the heart of our, of our topic today about cooperation uh, in, in among Southeast Asian countries. So the, the question is, um, um, well, quite literally, our homework is to establish ASEAN Coast Guard and Maritime Law Enforcement a forum uh, as a formal dialogue uh, for Coast Guards and Maritime Law Enforcement entities in the region. So as this, um, as this group gets together, um, you know, what role, number one, the prospects of that I would offer to Jay first. And then secondly, you've got a cooperation amongst you know, ASEAN countries, 10 countries, and then you have the role of extra regional players uh, and, and, and how that factors, when that should factor, is it simultaneous, as it comes sequentially? Just any thoughts on that, Jay, from, from your perspective? Uh, again, building an ASEAN Coast Guard and an MLE uh, a forum. Well, um, before discussing the initiative for um, the creation of uh, a ASEAN Coast Guard Forum um, that includes uh, the maritime law enforcement um, agencies in uh, Southeast Asia, um, I would uh, first highlight first that um, there are actually uh, existing um, regional um, uh, forum that was um, supported by the by uh, Japan. For example, we have HACGAM meeting. And then just recently, um, the United States government is also supporting the Simli meeting, the Southeast Asian Maritime Law Enforcement Initiative, which was uh, which started in, in Bangkok, in Thailand. So, but um, I think um, what made the ASEAN Coast Guard Forum and Maritime Law Enforcement Initiative much more unique compared with this two uh, um, initiative um, made by the Japan, Japanese government and the US government is that um, among the Southeast Asian countries, they wanted to have um, a forum within them that is not participated by external powers like US or Japan. So, um, but um, I'm not really sure whether it has already progressed. Um, as early as 2015, the Indonesian uh, government and the Philippine, Coast Guard, uh, Philippine government um, supported the creation of ASEAN Coast Guard Forum, but until now it hasn't really yet um, finalized. But um, I think uh, Southeast Asian countries um, are um, also excited to have those kind of um, forum wherein it's only just uh, the ASEAN countries. Thanks, Admiral. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, it's an interesting, uh, interesting question. And I think um, forums are the way forward, right? Because it, it speaks right to this, you know, kind of the the regional, you know, the regional network of Coast Guards. Um, so cut one, um, just sort of an, an observation and a thought. And one is um, having clarity for those countries who uh, you, you know would would participate in an ASEAN Coast Guard forum understanding sort of the scope of what you want uh, to accomplish with that um, multi multinational collaboration is an is an important starting point and then second the hardest part in these forums and I'm going to speak to the North Pacific Coast Guard forum in a minute uh, is you have to operationalize it otherwise you're just getting together once a year and talking about really hard problems um, but so you've you gotta you gotta come up with a way to turn it into action. So the North Pacific Coast Guard Forum for you know I don't know how familiar everyone may or may not be with it. Right? So it's Japan, Korea, Canada, Russia, China, and the United States. And um, so a couple things that are that are quite useful to this forum. We we do a, um, an experts meeting in the spring. Uh, we we missed a whole year last year. We're about to uh, uh, to convene here in a couple months in the Bay Area, and then a, then a higher level uh, summit in the in the fall. Uh, the bilaterals are actually written into it, so you sit down with every one of those Coast Guards and have a bilateral exchange as part of the forum. It's really important to keep those doors and lines of communication open as geopolitics in countries change. Having that avenue is uh, is really powerful. And then um, the best part about the North Pacific Coast Guard Forum is North Pacific Guard, which is the operational fisheries enforcement piece to it that we do every summer. Uh, typically, you know, we'll send a, um, a, a U.S. Uh, ship will go over into the region. Um, uh, often the Canadians will provide a long range fixed wing aircraft. 
and the Japanese um, provide uh, you know uh, runway and and access to to landing zone. So um, and that we do that every year. We uh, you know two and a half years ago had a major uh, you know boarding. We at the time had a Chinese fish rider on board one of the U.S. Coast Guard cutters boarded a Chinese flag fishing vessel, inspected it for compliance with the high seas drift net fishing. It was found you know sort of grossly out of compliance, and that vessel was. Uh, the voyage was terminated and a uh, vessel was escorted back into China. And I don't believe it's left left port since. So it's an example of how taking a collaborative forum uh, where you've got aligned and shared views, but then turning it into something tangible, um, you know, search and rescue exercises, comms exercises, passing exercises, uh, fisheries enforcement. Those are the types of um, sort of activities that you um, you really need to drive to or else it's just it's great to get around and drink, you know, drink coffee and talk about hard things uh, once a year. But you really want to, you know, move move the needle and in, uh, in advance. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, again, uh, your, your response really and 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 talking about the North Pacific Forum um, really brings up a great point. And and some of the uh, questions I see also ask about where are there areas of cooperation, even uh, you know, amidst the larger backdrop of strategic competition, if you will. I think that's a really good example. I've got a question from uh, Yasuhiro Okamoto. Uh, um, Admiral, this one is, is more specifically for you, but it really talks about uh, areas of interest for cooperation between the U.S. Coast Guard and the Japan Coast Guard. Any any areas in particular uh, that, that either we're working on more closely or, or ripe for, for, for work? Uh, just your thoughts on that, U.S. Japan. Yeah, so, um... You know, the Japanese Coast Guard is, uh, you know, we've had a long, long uh, relationship and partnership with the Japanese Coast Guard. Um, you know, a much younger version of me, uh, you know, remembers, visit, you know, this is 25 years ago, visits from the Japanese Coast Guard leadership to, to Coast Guard headquarters uh, to talk about, uh, you know, either training needs or policy or search and rescue. And in that, that partnership and strength can continues. One of the international engagements, you know, I, I did last fall uh, virtually was with uh, Japan Coast Guard to continue uh, that that conversation and um, and, and alignment. And so every time, you know, we have a ship uh, that we're able to send over to the region, we we always build in and look for opportunity to uh, interoperate alongside uh, Japan uh, Coast Guard. In fact. Uh, just uh, within, it's been inside of a month. I think it was only about two weeks ago. Uh, we had uh, Coast Guard Cutter Kimball, and I forget the name of the Japanese Coast Guard ship. I think it's the newest ship into the Japanese Coast Guard fleet, but you know, we're interoperating and uh, conducted uh, exercises alongside each other. And so, um, so it's kind of a non specific answer to the question, only in that right, we got these great, this great line of communication. So there's, I don't feel that we've got this like pent up. Uh, need or demand that um, you know we need to address as Coast Guards because because we've got that enduring, uh, continuing uh, interaction and, and we've got that with other Coast Guards in the region as well and um, you know again when we talk about this this kind of network of Coast Guards it's those kinds of regular engagements um, and from the senior senior most people uh, down to and including training opportunities where you know we might be able to bring a training team in or or folks come to our uh, training courses. As you know, we mentioned, we've got Philippine uh, Coast Guard cadets at the Coast Guard Academy right now. Those are all, uh, all ways that we, we, um, we, we build, uh, you know, a, a stronger, a stronger net. So there's not one specific thing that I can think of right now with, uh, with Japan, other than we're, we're absolutely committed uh, and remain committed to that, that relationship, same as we do to the, uh, the Philippine Coast Guard could not be uh, you know, one of the questions I thought we might get is, you know, what's how would you characterize the Philippine Coast Guard relationship? And I would just I would describe it as strong and trending up uh, in all all good uh, good ways. And I think there's just a lot of, lot of opportunity for uh, for both the organizations. Thanks. Well, thanks very much, Admiral. And actually, that your your last comment kind of foreshadows another uh, question. This actually uh, kind of rolls up several questions from the group. Uh, and uh, and it, it comes up in every discussion. Uh, and so this, this addresses um, Rudyard Samara's question, um, um, uh, several others talking about uh, gray zone uh, tactics being used by China. Um, China's response, uh, I'll say simply writ large to the uh, arbitral tribunal decision, essentially uh, casting it aside and ignoring it. 
the, the whole nine dash line tension, the use of uh, their fleets, and then the currently uh, the about 200 some flotilla that's that's currently in the EEZ. So that that's that's the, the context of the question, and 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 the specific part is, you know, how do you see the U.S. and the Philippines um, partnering, supporting each other, uh, or I should really say the U.S. supporting uh, um, the Philippines in this particular in instance, or the U.S. and that for that matter, um, you know, supporting longstanding positions for you know, international law. So over to Jay first. Um, this is kind of a roll up of so many questions that are out there, but it's, it's always the elephant in the room uh, that uh, looking for creative ways of how the US might support a uh, Philippine given this tension. Over, Jay. Um, thank you very much, Admiral, for the question. Um, I think um, for us to be able to really uh, move forward in um, addressing uh, those um, increasing gray zone strategy in South China Sea, I think um, the most important thing that the, um, uh, U.S. Coast Guard can support the Philippines is that um, we can actually uh, include um, the discussion of uh, how I, I've been saying this repeti repetitively, but I would like to just mention that the Philippine Coast Guard vessels is to be recognized as a public vessels. And that uh, since the Philippine Coast Guard vessels are the one being used now as a primary option in patrolling uh, the contested waters, specifically in carrying out maritime law enforcement in South China Sea. I think um, um, it is right time for us to discuss um, the importance of the Coast Guard, uh, the Philippine Coast Guard vessels as um, part of um, uh, public vessels that could, uh, that is covered by the articles four and five of the Mutual Defense Treaty. And it's not just the Philippine Navy vessels, but it also includes the Philippine Coast Guard vessels as it respond to uh, gray zone tactics in the South China Sea. So I think that's the most important part that we need to uh, uh, look at right now. Thanks, Jay. So, you know, and I've, uh, you know, I keep coming back to, uh, you know, partnerships and, and networks and multinational. So, you know, first, just with regard to the, you know, kind of, um, you know, bilateral exchanges and engagements that we have as a U.S. Coast Guard to, to Philippine Coast Guard, right? I, um, as I said, that's a, that, that's a, a longstanding and robust partnership. And, um, you know, I believe we've, we've got the venues uh, to open, uh, you know, open on any and all of these discussions. So one of the things that I, I think the U.S. Coast Guard does particularly well is, you um, we don't we don't go to a country and say hey here's what I'm going to offer. You know, instead, it's it's what what might you find useful from us? Is it um, a mechanic to teach you how to uh, repair your your small boat engines, or do we need to talk uh, you know more more broadly from a, a maritime code and laws within the country? Or and is Jay's um, you know leaning into is there a larger uh, you know, diplomatic conversation that needs to go on around our uh, commitments and understanding of long, long-standing treaties. I think all of those venues are are in place between the the two countries, and you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm very encouraged by that. This is so one of the other areas. So you know, there are some big coast guards and navies around the region that uh, are absolutely peers, and uh, we you know we actively uh, seek those opportunities to operate. Where we also spend a lot of time in is in some of the smaller uh, Pacific nations who may not have as much uh, capacity uh, and capability as Philippines Coast Guard, Japan Coast Guard, Korea, uh, and in help you know helping to build out that capacity so that there are others that are able to be engaged partners uh, in the in the region. And I think, you know, so again, this is we've, we've got our bilateral commitments, but there are broader, uh, you know, areas of emphasis and focus that uh, will will be absolutely required, you know, particularly as Jay says, right, this is gray zone and it's gray for a reason, which means it's, uh, you know, it's, it's ambiguous and uh, is going to take a, uh, you know, a network of many uh, willing and like minded uh, partners to, to get after some of the threat. Thanks. 
Thanks very much. Um, this next question, you know, you know, not everything we talk about needs to be contentious, uh, you know, in the, all these thorny issues that come to play. So in the area of HADR, um, there's a great question from Joseph Digby uh, in our audience. How do the U.S., Philippines, and our ASEAN partners optimize, optimize now, monitoring and response efforts for HADR operations by their Coast Guards. I mean, one would think that this could be a, a very non-contentious issue, an area of common ground, but does any thoughts on that, Jay, are you and then Admiral? Um, for um, Coast Guard in uh, Southeast Asia, we usually have bilateral search and rescue for if we're going to discuss with uh, other humanitarian activities, like for example, search and rescue, if there will be like uh, typhoons that would, um, uh, affect some of the fishermen from Indonesia or Malaysia or the Philippines and then um, even for Taiwan. Um, the Philippines and other Southeast Asian countries have this uh, search and rescue bilateral agreement wherein they can uh, support each other in uh, locating their missing fishermen um, in those cases that they, they were probably affected by um, uh, the typhoon that happened. And then for uh, uh, to be more specific for other disaster response, I, um, the Philippines, uh, the Philippine Coast Guard and other Southeast Asian co Coast Guard are not as um, uh, as um, big or um, as capable of the armed forces of or the military of other uh, compared with the Coast Guard of the in the region. So in a higher context of HAADR in regional support, we usually rely or uh, just assist uh, the armed forces of the Philippines, for example, and then for ASEAN Coast Guard to also support their uh, respective military institutions. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, so, um, you know, we obviously as a, as a you, a lot of this is, again, just kind of a function of the time distance, right? You know, in a HADR situation, time is of the essence. And so the, you know, the ships and the aircraft um, from countries that are positioned the closest are, are really often the ones that are in most demand and, and need to just you know, begin um, flowing what, what may be, be needed to, to counter uh, whatever uh, the effect may have been. And you know, so, so US Coast Guard forces, you know, as in the majority of our force does operate, you know, kind of in and around the coastal region of the US and Alaska and Hawaii. Um, so, you know, like the, the Haiti earthquake, there was a, a you know, large HADR, uh, you know, request there that then, you know, it resulted in, in Coast Guard uh, forces that flowed and, um, and assisted. Uh, Again, kind of back to one of the really great things about uh, Coast Guard cutters and authorities, um, it allows us just to be incredibly nimble and responsive to whatever uh, the demand signal or ask uh, might might be. Uh, and you know, so long as you know, we've got the capacity, where our, one of our sweet spots as an organization is in, um, you know, not not. HADR, but so it incident management and then disaster response as it pertains, uh, you know, sort of specifically to the U.S. and some of the, um, you know, fairly increasingly regular hurricane uh, impacts that we have uh, around our coastal areas. And, you know, the Coast Guard is the force that comes in and does the, you know, starts the initial search and rescue and begins the immediate um, assistance of, of folks in distress as our DOD and National Guard and other counterparts are rallying to come, come in, in behind us. We kind of, we're the quick twitch game and we wait for the, uh, uh, you know, for the larger uh, military force. Cause once they get moving, man, you just got to get out of their way. Cause they're going to, they're going to run you over, but it's a little bit like, uh, you know, Jay's experience. There are other forces then larger than us that uh, we just can't, uh, we can't get in the way of. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, Great analogies, by the way. Um, uh, this next question, you know, the whole discussion about cooperation and, and you know, uh, burden sharing, if you will, or responsing and how you do these collaboratively. And you get down to the logistics side of it, and there's two questions actually in the audience, but I'll kind of combine them. Uh, the logistics side of it, you know, operating from, from, from other countries' ports. So does any comments about uh, the, the ability of US Coast Guard vessels to operate from a, a Philippine port? or perhaps a Japanese port? And uh, again, Jay, from your perspective, and then Admiral Fagan. 
Um, honestly, I, I'm not really sure about the logistical <laughs> support for, for us to give the United States Coast Guard once they visit the Manila port. Is, is it the question or? Uh, no, it's more about if, if, if there were to be some arrangement. I know there's always a danger in the hypothetical question, but maybe it already exists, but whatever you can share. But, but um, you know, hand in hand with compatibility and collaboration is, you know, the ability to come and go and replenish from various, you know, overseas ports, so to speak. Uh, so, you know, so my question is how rich, how robust is that particular relationship? You know, the ability of a U.S. Coast Guard vessel to, uh, to come and go or support a particular effort uh, from, from a port, whether it be in the Philippines or in Japan. Uh, and again, it is not a leading question. Is this a simple, um, nothing hey, nefarious I'll, here? <laughs> I'll, I'll, ju I'll jump out that one. I'll jump out it for you, Jay. So, I, you know, there's no formal uh, agreement, but part of all of the, you know, the, the, the scheme of maneuver and con up and planning that goes into a deployment. You know, we've got teams churning way down here that literally, you know, port, they plan out that, you know, because if, if you don't have the logistics right, you really got a problem. And, uh, you know, that, that work through port, port by port, uh, are we going to be able to get fuel, food, water, everything that you need to support that ship? What we've done with the national security cutters, and you know, we mentioned the Bertoff and the Stratton and some of the, those been, you know, and as I said, Kimball's over in, in the region now, uh, those big deployments, um, we've we've pretty we rely fairly heavily on, on Seventh Fleet and some of the some of the Navy uh, capacity that that's in the region and, and um, uh, primarily in Japan. And so some of you may have seen the uh, fire that we had on the Weishi. Uh, back uh, mid December, she was literally she could not have been further from anywhere. Literally in the middle of the Pacific, the closest ship was three days steam away. Uh, she spent about a day and a half. DIW. We're very fortunate we didn't lose the ship, and very fortunate we didn't hurt anybody. Uh, but she finally she got herself back under power, and then it was another I think five or six days into Japan, where she spent then quite a bit of time in Yakuska, uh, being supported by the by the Japanese. So. For us, you know, when we start, because our national security cutters are very similar to, to, you know, frigate, DDG kind of thing. So that we just, we, we leverage as much as we can off of our, uh, our big Navy uh, brothers when we can, because it's just, um, we just don't have that, that forward logistics uh, footprint. The smaller ships are a little, they, they tend to be easier to get into places and easier to support, but it literally is a ship by ship, port by port, trip by trip conversation that we, uh, we've got to get after. Oh, thanks so much. Uh, and I'll tell you, our time is running uh, running out, so I'm going to probably hold, I will hold the questions up there. I, I want to, first of all, thank um, our, our, both of our speakers. Uh, we, we covered uh, 23 questions by my count here amongst the audience, and we still have almost 300 people out there. Uh, amazing. Uh, thanks for your tremendous uh, presentations. Uh, what a rich topic um, uh, and so many things to explore. But thank you for your time, Admiral Fagan. Uh, uh, Commander Tristan, thanks so much uh, um, um, uh, really uh, for your, your, your comments today. Uh, let me just uh, make a couple of remarks. Um, uh, just about staying tuned uh, to our second edition of this uh, US Philippine Indo-Pacific conversation series. Uh, Jeff I, or Daniel, uh, who's online, I'm not sure we have a date set for the next event, but you can always go to www.pacforum.org. Plus, we send out announcements, of course, regularly to all of the folks following us. Uh, please, uh, please stay tuned to that. Um, also, uh, just a big reminder for everyone in this group, I can't resist, um, but next week on the 30th and 31st of March, uh, we have a, 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 our, our major virtual gala Pacific Forums hosting. Uh, we've got speakers lined up, a really great slate. We, on the 30th, we've got the Honorable Richard Armitage. He'll open up with keynote remarks. On the 31st, we've got Admiral Davidson, Commander U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, providing perspectives on, on, the, on the entire region uh, from, uh, from his, uh, his perch, uh, U.S. Indo-PACOM uh, Command. Uh, then follow, uh, after that, we've got Ms. Mimi Bird, who, who will be speaking about events uh, in Myanmar. And then wrapping up, we've got a special roundtable session for uh, for for, uh, for our, our our donors. Um, we'll be featuring our, our Pacific Forum uh, International Chairman Jim Kelly and our former President Emeritus uh, Ralph Casa, focusing uh, on Indo-Pacific uh, you know, security issues, but also perspectives on Northeast Asia. So it's a real rich lineup uh, Monday, Tuesday. 
you can find out about that on our on our on our website. Um, but uh, thanks again for joining us today. Again, Admiral uh, Admiral Fagan uh, uh, and Jay, uh, thank you so much for some really uh, illuminating comments. Thanks everybody. Mahalo and aloha. Thank you.